Thank you, Raj. Um, I think in my presentation, I don't know if I'm going to completely agree with you with regards to debridement, so we'll let the audience decide what, what's best. So appreciate your comments. I'm going to speak to you today about uh, uh, trying to heal uh, venous ulcers in a very challenging population, that being the obese. No disclosures. This is a, a slide that's often uh, shown at many meetings regarding venous disease and the uh, prevalence. And uh, it's probably more than uh, 10 or 15 years old, these pictures. But I suspect that uh, the skin ulcer rate or venous ulcer rate now in the United States is probably in the order of uh, over 800 or 900,000 people, uh, particularly with the uh, uh, prevalence of increased morbid obesity as well. Uh, I'm going to show you some heat maps. This is a, a behavioral risk factor uh, survey of the United States. And this was the, looking at uh, those individuals in the United States with a BMI of greater than 30. And this uh, shows that a lot of data in this particular time frame of 1985 was incomplete. But just to give you a sense of a BMI of, of 30, that would be um, a person who's 5'4", being 30 pounds overweight. So that's pretty significant uh, uh, in terms of being obese. Here is a picture from 1995. And you can see here in this heat map that uh, in the blue states, uh, 15 to 19 percent had a BMI of 30 or greater in the Mississippi and Ohio River Valley, and also predominantly in the south. If we go to 2005, 10 years later, now you can start to see in Mississippi and Louisiana greater than 30 percent or one in three or greater than one in three individuals have a BMI of greater than 30. And if you look at 2009, now we're, goodness, six years from now, uh, from then I should say, you can again see the scourge of uh, obesity that's uh, laid upon us. So I have to say, uh, Raj, being in Mississippi, uh, having some challenging patients and having them not wear stockings after venous stenting is pretty impressive. Here are categories. Uh, just for those in the audience, you can see obese, 30 to 34, morbidly obese, 35 to 39 with BMI, and super morbidly obese of greater than 40. And again, uh, there are different classes of obesity as well, and just kind of a cartoon showing uh, class one, two, and three of, uh, of, of those with obese and the super morbidly obese with a BMI of greater than 40. I'm going to share a little bit of data that was published at the American Venus Forum. We've also published this data at the SVS. Uh, the American Venus Forum was involved in the National Venus Screening Program. Uh, for about five years. And this particular uh, paper that was presented, uh, the, uh, the objective was to determine the differences in venous disease across the spectrum of, of BMI from participants in the National Venus Screening Program. And uh, the National Venus Screening Program really was, uh, they, there was about 140 sites across America, and it really was just a one-day event where um, uh, individuals could come in on their own uh, and get screened. It was not a random, randomly selected population. But we had uh, over 7,000 people uh, over time participate in the National Venus Screening Program. And this is the BMI distribution. And you can see here that about 65% of those coming in just to be screened for a free screening of venous disease, both uh, for chronic venous disease, were either uh, obese morbidly obese or, or overweight. And one of the things we found was is that with increasing weight came increasing um, SEEP classification scores, uh, i.e. signs of chronic venous disease. And for the uh, morbidly obese and super morbidly obese, this was uh, statistically different uh, in both lower extremities compared to uh, uh, normal individuals. You can also see here that these are percents over here. Um, individuals came in and get a very brief ultrasound screening of their common femoral, their popliteal, and their great saphenous vein. And just looking at the common femoral veins, again, 
uh, although the um, history in these, in these particular individuals was virtually zero for a history of uh, DVT, you can see that obstruction rates were, were uh, nearly double that uh, in this large population compared to uh, normal individuals. And similarly, in terms of, or more interestingly, in terms of venous reflux, you can see there was no significant difference. And this 20% was one, this, is, this is, should be left, right limb, left limb. This was at least one segment of the four segments looked at that shows evidence of vagular reflux. And you can see here, interestingly, no difference between all different categories. So when you look at these results, you have an increasing seed classification minimal to no history of DVT in this population, slight increase of 2% in the morbidly obese population of obstruction, uh, and no increase in reflux across these. So you have increasing seep classification and signs of chronic venous disease, but no differences in reflux. Why is that? Well, there are three basic components of chronic venous disease. One is reflux, two is obstruction, and the third is pump dysfunction. And which pump am I talking about? We're talking about the calf muscle pump uh, in patients who have obesity. And that's what I'm going to focus on today is the calf muscle pump. So let's just look at a few papers of the calf muscle pump. You can see here, this is an old paper uh, in 1994, the significance of the calf muscle pump and venous ulceration. 69 limbs underwent air plethysmography. 30 of them had C6 or active ulcer disease and almost all the limbs underwent venous reflux testing. And what, did, what did this show? Well, amongst all those groups, there was no difference in venous uh, reflux between the three groups. Very important to note. But when you looked at ejection fraction of the calf, you can see in those individuals with just um, uh, C2 disease or varicose veins versus those with C5 disease or a healed ulcer versus those with an active ulcer, you can see that the ejection fraction of the calf is significantly lower. Similarly, for residual volume fraction or the amount of blood left in the calf after, after 10 uh, uh, toe-ups or calf, calf contractions, you can see that the amount of blood left in the calf in someone with an with a, uh, active ulcer is significantly higher. Here's another um, article published in 2007, Calf Muscle Pump Impairment and Delayed Healing of Venous Ulcers, looking at air plethysmograph findings. And they looked at 129 patients with venous ulcers. They found pump failure in about 42% of them. These typically were older patients. They had larger ulcers, and their healing times were prolonged. The paper did not comment on uh, BMI. And lastly, here's a... Here's a uh, uh, a uh, paper done by uh, P Frank Padberg uh, looking at 31 patients with C4, 5, and 6 disease. They all had compression hose. You can see here that 18 were randomized to physical therapy and calf exercises for six months, and 13 just had the hose and did not go to physical therapy. Look at the mean BMI of these two groups, 33 and 35 respectively. And there was no difference Again, I want to emphasize no difference in reflux between these two groups of patients. And if you look at the results, you can see here uh, for the control group, the residual volume fraction didn't change. It actually went up, uh, not significantly, but it did rise. And the ejection fraction of the calf did not change. But interestingly, for those patients undergoing physical therapy, their, their residual volume uh, fraction changed and went down and their ejection fraction of the calf improved significantly from 41 to 46. So let, I'm just going to give you kind of my biased philosophy on how to take care of these patients who are typically obese or particularly morbidly obese that come in with these large leg ulcers. Um, I was a medical director for a wound care center uh, at, in my previous life for seven years uh, while working as a vascular surgeon. And um, you see these patients come in. It's not uncommon that they've seen multiple doctors over time and have tried everything. Uh, often these ulcers are large, weeping, infected. Uh, there's often a sense that everything has been done for these patients, yet when you talk to the patient, 
really nothing's being done for the most part. They continue to work or they continue to be home. They continue to be disabled by these large ulcers. Um, there's usually on physical exam minimal evidence of varicose veins. And when you do reflux testing, you often don't find any reflux. And uh, often not evidence, at least from the groin down, of uh, obstruction. So the first order of business when you want to try to heal any chronic wound uh, is really this simple um, algorithm. You want to assure that there's arterial perfusion to the limb. You want to eliminate edema. Edema is the enemy. Uh, treat infection if it's present. Uh, if there's any necrotic tissue, frankly necrotic tissue, you want to debride it. And then in this particular patient population with an active ulcer, treat venous pathology, as Dr. Raju spoke about, and then you want to optimize host factors, such as uh, nutrition, uh, diabetes, and if you can, uh, get someone to lose weight, which is a, probably the most challenging of, of, of everything. So uh, calf muscle pump dysfunction uh, is, is, as I've stated before, is the primary problem in, in, in patients who are morbidly obese and have an active ulcer. And the key here is to eliminate limb dependency. So these patients typically have, they go in to see doctors, they get prescribed compression, and they say, go home and keep your leg up. Well, that does not happen. They do not keep their leg up. It just does not happen. The only thing that's going to get them to keep their leg up is to get them in the hospital, and even after that, a skilled nursing facility. And I'm talking about patients who've had ulcers for months to most often years that come to you, okay? They've, everything that they've had done has failed, okay? So for, for myself, I've had about one to two dozen of these patients in, over the years. There's not a lot of them, but they do come in. You, you basically um, get them in the hospital for a week, do aggressive nursing care, and then often get them in a skilled nursing facility for three to six weeks. Uh, and then, I don't usually do split thickness skin grafting for venous ulcer care, but, the, but in these large ulcers, uh, it can work very, very well, but you have to continue them during this time of uh, four to six weeks in a skilled nursing facility, and then have a very, very, very slow transition in the wound care center from uh, uh, compression therapy or multi-layer compression therapy to, to, uh, to um, uh, regular compression such as a, a circade. I just want to speak, just digress a little bit regarding elastic and inelastic compression. This is a graph uh, published by Hugo Parch, who's really kind of the father of compression therapy, a uh, vascular surgeon in France. And one of the things that's important to note here is that uh, the, uh, the use of inelastic compression, such as a multi-layer compression bandage or an unaboot or a circade, the, the hemodynamics are uh, much, much better in terms of the variance of calf muscle pump function here. You can see high to low, as well as the, the decrease of resting pressures uh, in the supine position uh, and after 24 hours in terms of how low the, the, the venous pressures can be. So here's a patient I took care of um, uh, several years ago. This is a 53-year-old woman who had a BMI of 46. She came to see me in the wound care center. She uh, was working full-time for the government uh, state, uh, for the state of Illinois as a secretary and had this on her leg uh, while she was working. Um, she had had this for five years and she had minimal reflux on duplex and she also, um, um, in speaking with her, kind of having the come to Jesus talk, I told her that um, if she was able to give me about six weeks of her life, we would be able to get this healed. Just prescribing wound care, giving compression, and having them go home doesn't work. It's going to fail. It's not going to work. So you bring these patients in the hospital. You essentially have to use the crux of IV antibiotics to justify them being there. She fortunately had a fair amount of sick time, uh, and we were able to bring her in the hospital uh, and did split thickness skin grafting, 
got her to a skilled nursing facility, and she was out within six weeks, and we were able to get her completely healed. Um, the thing about split th thickness skin grafting, people often talk about, well, it fails. It fails because you do it and then you send the patient home. It doesn't work. You gotta keep that patient, you gotta treat that split thickness skin graft like your firstborn child. Uh, and even when she looked like this, I had her in a multi-layer compression dre dressing uh, bandage for a week, uh, probably for another four to six weeks, protecting that skin graft and getting it more and more healthy. When you finally do get this healed and you, trans and you transition a patient like this to a circade, they will take a bullet for you. They really will. She had this for five years. And I don't say this to toot my own horn, I just say that when you finally get a patient like this healed who's had an ulcer for years, they really will commit to being compliant in my, in my view. Uh, after so many times of failed compliance, of going home. So, for the morbidly obese and an active ulcer, I uh, reserve ablation for those patients who have true evidence of great saphenous, small saphenous, or accessory reflux. Very rare, but I've done an occasional uh, uh, percutaneous uh, perforator uh, ablation, uh, and those are reserved for those that are greater than three millimeters and near the area of the ulcer or a recalcitrant ulcer. I personally do not take an aggressive stance on those with secondary venous disease uh, uh, until after about six to eight weeks uh, with doing venography and IVUS. I typically, I'm getting more MRVs now, but typically I, it was so easy just to go do venography and IVUS, I would just, and often the, the MRVs are not that specific and sensitive. So that's kind of my algorithm of, of, of whether we should go looking for obstruction. For those patients with post-thrombotic syndrome, I think you should be more aggressive in terms of uh, going to the, the cath lab uh, or the endo suite uh, and uh, um, um, opening any evidence of obstruction in the iliac veins. So, um, as I've said before, the key to success in the morbidly obese uh, for uh, uh, preventing recurrence is education. Um, very, very, very slow transition to inelastic compression. Uh, often these patients are socioeconomically challenged. Uh, it would not be uncommon for me to talk to hospital administrators uh, to try to get uh, advocacy for these patients in terms of having them get healed with a single hospital admission. Um, I've referred these patients to bariatrics but never had any success with bariatric programs for some reason. Um, and then uh, you want to see these patients frequently back initially. So the challenges and opportunities, um, a lot of, lot of different things can cause edema and pain in the patient's uh, lower extremities with, with morbid obesity or obesity. And it's important to, to, to sift those out closely before uh, jumping to any conclusions. Uh, the key here is the calf pump and getting rid of limb dependency. Um, and then uh, I just think that in these particular rare patients, it does require a very selective approach uh, in, 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 and a big commitment to the patient to get them healed. So lastly, if you don't have the uh, Fat Booth app uh, on your iPhone, you can get that and you can see what you look like uh, if you are uh, morbidly obese. So I appreciate your attention and thank you very much.